Hello, Woden's Day. Let's start in the United States of America and race ethnic profiles by age group. What we've got here is uh, different age groups. Let's start at the bottom, should we? Start at the bottom, the big blue sticky out along the edge bar, 85% it says, and then 5% of 85-year-olds or older in the United States are Hispanic, 7% black, a few Asians, few other, and two, two other races. A little splodge at the bottom in the other colored blue. So most all of the 85-year-olds and over are pure in the United States. But when we go to the top of the graph, we get 51% of new children being born are pure white people. And this was from the 2010 census data and the way things are moving you can be quite sure that most all babies now being born in the United States most of them are making made up from the grouping which are Hispanic black Asian other or multiple races whites are now being born as a minority in the United States of America are you bothered an excellent article by Richard Smith. Displacement activity, Minsky moment, abreaction. It's only a short article, but I, I, I really like the way it was put together. I've highlighted a small part, maybe gives a flavour, but it doesn't. It's for, follow the link, read it. It's only a short article. Angel Guria, head of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, said, the government, governance, governance, the governance right now is not going through a very brilliant moment. I have to say, neither in Europe nor in the United States, the signals that are coming out of the short-term discussions is... We can't even agree about the time of the day, even if there's a big clock telling us what the time of the day is. And that is seemingly how the powers that be seem to be handling it at the moment, as in they're just squabbling. Ambrose Evans Pritchard article using the same photo of Christine Lagarde. Recovery is in danger if we don't shore up defences, says Christine Lagarde under her own photo. Christine Lagarde, the IMF's new chief, set off tremors at the Jackson Hole summit over the weekend with warnings that the global financial system is on very thin ice and vulnerable to the slightest shock. Very similar to the article written by the, the girls that I quoted whenever I did. Monday was it? We are in a dangerous uh, new phase. Uh, the stakes are clear. We risk seeing the fragile recovery derailed. So we must act now, she said. Actually, she's got a very decent English accent. But um, a very fragile recovery could be dis derailed, so we must act now. And that's the tricky bit. What do you do? Banks need urgent recapitalization. It is not, if it is not addressed, we could easily see the further spread of economic weakness. If you don't ca recapitalize banks, you might get the further spread of economic weakness to core countries. Interesting. Even a debilitating liquidity crisis. Uh, although um, the ECB said there was no liquidity crisis. The most efficient solution would be mandatory substantial recapitalization, she said. It's all very interesting, isn't it? I mean, mandatory substantial recapitalization of the banks, that means they need more equity. Now, equity is just a buffer against the outside world in the in a case of in an extreme case, bankruptcy. If everything's closed down, they grab all the equity first and use that to plug the gap that is obviously short on the asset side to pay off the liability side. That's what they want all this recapitalization is for, is to have a buffer if there are bankruptcies. So that buffer is eaten up first. So they want 
she wants mandatory substantial recapitalization that's so that's got to be mandated man, who is going to be forced into buying this 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 buffer stock of bank uh, equity you can say well the banks have got to be forced into making it bigger and if they don't sell new issues of shares to, to make it bigger they've got to hold profits increase profits hold profits so sack some people don't pay out dividends that would do the job um, yeah they've got to increase the profits because the profits are technically owned by the equity that's why you buy equity but how can you force people into buying the equity you really got and how can you force the banks into raising equity when she was in charge at the time where the stress tests said that most of the banks didn't need it they do tie themselves in knots but I'm not knocking it I'm not because I mean it's such a problem there's no answer but that's I think what they are finding out anyway let's get onto a chart of something because we know where we are with charts disposable personal income per capita growth nominal versus real this is the United States and it's a Doug Short chart that's why it's so wonderfully clear and nominal is the disposable personal income per capita and he's allowed for uh, increases in the population and inflation but nominal um, inflations in that one but when you allow for inflation and the um, per capita increases in population you get that red one and you can see that disposable income really isn't going anywhere at all in the United States from 2000 to now it's only gone up 15 percent compounding over all that time which isn't really much at all and I mentioned that because at the heart of this is to pay the debt off the people need more money to pay the debt off and this is a shocking article in patrick.net a young couple with seven hundred and eighty three thousand dollars of debt um, read it it's frightening at the, at the bottom basically uh, his advice and he's an expert in this sort of being sensible says sell your new townhouse immediately sell your condo concurrently sell your car stroke cars and pay off the loans immediately using any remaining equity funds from the above sales to pay off any other and all debt rent a nice apartment or home for a couple of years and buy a conservative used car with the cash and what we're going to get into here is the paradox of thrift that is what is best for that couple and there are so many that couples around that if they all do the sensible thing it really sucks an awful lot of go out of the economy of all countries that are doing that sort of sensible thing paradox of thrift but real personal consumption expenditure in the United States calculated risk chart is 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 racking up quite nicely the uh, if you look at the um, axis on the left it's not big numbers we're talking about well nine trillion is a big number but it's only going from nine trillion to nine trillion three hundred and fifty billion but it is going up nicely as long as that carries on it's another paradox as long as people probably getting themselves into debt to spend this money um, that does give the economy more go but is that what we want is that sustainable mm. And from the same article, a different chart, personal savings as a percentage of disposable personal income. And you can see the savings rate for the American people from the crises of double dip of 80 and to 81, 82. Um, it was at 12%. But after that catastrophe, everything got strange and nobody wanted to save anymore, or at least didn't save anymore and the rate got down to near zero uh, one percent on this occasion but you can see since the um, this great recession started it's trying to average at about five and nobody knows how it'll go after that but the paradox of thrift will probably when the meme gets into everyone's head that um, borrowing money isn't the clever thing to do that might rise again to ten percent which will take 
loads of go out of the economy. Ireland's business blog Lisa O'Carroll uh, mortgage arrears rise sharply in Ireland. Interest rate hikes, fuel costs and austerity measures are pushing people into arrears as new figures show the house price decline continues. So sad for the people of Ireland because lots of figures out of Ireland say that they're really keeping things together extremely well f for the adversity that they're under. But um, they're just getting kicked in the nuts at every turn. Uh, this is the residential property price index. Yeah, just frighteningly horrible. You can see it's halved. It was near 140 and now it's down to 70. The spotty lines, are, I think, are the Dublin and ex-Dublin numbers. But either, all of them are shockingly horrible. And that's the sort of thing that can happen when you've had a housing price bubble. Give Karl Marx a chance to save the world. Bloomberg article by George Magnus, a very wily, brilliant economic man. Works for UBS, I think, at the moment. Chief economist, analyst. Just been in the business for ages and just sits there being wise. Policymakers struggling to understand the barrage of financial panics, protests and other ills afflicting the world would do well to study the works of a long-dead economist, Karl Marx. The sooner they recognise we're facing a once-in-a-lifetime crisis of capitalism, the better equipped they will be to manage a way out of it. And in a way that refers to all the squabbling that um, I referred to earlier in this presentation um, if they could uh, but even so they 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 recognize that they're facing a once-in-a-lifetime crisis of capitalism but they wouldn't really agree what that crisis was but before you can ever cure anything you've got to work out what the, the problem is first and they're just not doing it not getting anywhere close to it the spirit of Marx, who is buried in a cemetery close to where I live in North London, that's George Magnus, when he's not in Switzerland, has actually, I think he works out of London for UBS, has risen from the grave amid the financial crisis and subsequent economic slump. The wily philosophers and analysis of capitalism had a lot of flaws, but today's global economy bears some uncanny resemblances to the conditions he foresaw. Consider, for example, Marx's prediction of how the inherent conflict between capital and labour would manifest itself. As he wrote in Das Kapital, that I struggled to read a few years ago, it's only short, but it just doesn't, it's not easy reading. Companies' pursuit of profits and productivity would naturally lead them to need fewer and fewer workers. Yeah. Companies' pursuit of profits and productivity would naturally lead them to need fewer and fewer workers, creating an industrial reserve army. <laughs> unemployed people. Ooh. Of the poor and unemployed. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is, therefore, at the same time, an accumulation of misery at the other pole. And that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Project Syndicate. Uh, Dominic Moisey gives us an article, Who Will Help the Poor? Paris, he writes, from... With the deepening and economic crisis and the prospect of another recession looming large on the horizon, growing social inequality has become an increasingly urgent issue. To who? To whom? Who to? How does one reinforce a sense of solidarity and responsibility within a country? Who will protect, protect the weakest? This could almost only be written in Paris, couldn't it? As I ponder this issue, I am reminded of a debate that I had more than ten years ago in Berlin with the German theologian Hans Kung and Amer American and Asian participants. The subject was globalisation and ethics, specifically a comparison of the ways that Europe, 
the United States and Asia protect the most fragile members of their respective societies. All of those participants agreed that in Europe the state traditionally filled the role played by private philanthropy in the United States and by the family in Asia. But we all hasten to add that the model was pure, i.e. The, fam the family, the model was not pure, surely that should read. The family was no longer what it used to be in Asia. The state was playing a bigger role than expected in America and it was often underperforming in Europe. All part of the confusion. But what, what I'm getting at is here, as the deepening and economic crisis, the prospect of another recession looms large upon the horizon, growing social inequality, etc., people are going to be become more and more peopley. And depending what you think people are, I don't think people are fundamentally very pleasant. And as the shit hits the fan, the people will become more and more unpleasant. And they will look around for people to blame. Minorities, whatever it might be. But it won't be them to blame, that's for sure. And when that happens, you don't get... You can't get a global or area or regional... Um, decision made on anything because everyone's just blaming each other so things split apart and get worse hey bye